Now, when we recorded the last few videos, which is six years ago now, uh, at the time of filming, which is 2020, we talked about how dramatic the progress had been. And I was fully expecting at the time that you know, another th two or three years in the future would have many, many more imaging results to report. So what's happened? Over the last few years, a number of specialised instruments have been deployed, specifically designed to do this um, high contrast imaging for exoplanets. Um, examples are Sphere at the e European Southern Observatory's Very Large Telescope and GPI on Gemini South. These instruments use high order adaptive optics with bendy mirrors which can be very carefully deformed and many, many other tricks to get really high contrast imaging. And they've been given huge amounts of time on these telescopes. Instead of having samples of 50 or 60 um, stars that have been imaged, they're doing samples of hundreds and hundreds of these things. And it must be said, the results have been somewhat underwhelming. New exoplanets have been seen in imaging. Now, these surveys have been targeting stars that are very young, the idea being the planets are also very young and therefore are going to be self-luminous and you can see them. So it's basically a survey for very young, very hot, massive planets far out. And they have seen a few, but really quite depressingly small numbers. For the huge investment in instrumentation and time, it's not been very impressive. They're typically finding that maybe you know, half a percent or 0.6 percent of large stars have these um, massive planets far enough out that they can see them. Here's an example of some of these new data. So here are a bunch of images. There's a star and there's a planet, the star of the planet. In this particular case, HR8799, there are actually three imaged planets observing it. And the sort of stats they do for these surveys are diagrams like we see at the bottom here. Out here we're plotting how far out this planet is from the star, so that's 10 astronomical units, is 100 astronomical units and the mass of the companion planet. So that's Jupiter mass 10 times Jupiter mass, 100 times Jupiter mass. And what these plots are showing are the probability of being able to see a planet if it had those properties. So you can see the scale over here. So yellow is 1. That means if there was a planet at this particular distance with that particular mass, we would definitely see it. Purple is 0. If there was a planet with these properties, you definitely would not see it. And there are various in-between areas where you might or might not be able to see it. And so there are limits. If it gets too close into the star, you can't see it because it's blocked by the coronagraph. If it's too far out, you can't see it because there's only a small field of view and the adaptive optics only correct a small region. If the planet is, not, is too small, then you're not going to see it because it's not bright enough. And what you can do is plot where the planets you actually see lie on this diagram. So this planet here, it's uh, a little bit more than 10 astronomical units out, and it's maybe um, two or three Jupiter masses. And that's right on the edge of what you can see. So you got kind of lucky to see it. If it was even a little bit smaller, a little bit closer, and you wouldn't see it. This planet is much closer in. It's only a few astronomical units out, but it's very massive. It's more than 10 Jupiter masses, which is why they were able to see it even though it's close in. This one again is on the hairy edge of what you can see. These ones are much easier to see. They are quite massive, you know, 8 or 10 solar masses, and far enough out to be in the sweet spot where they're easy to spot. So these are the sort of data you do. You look at where the objects you actually see lie in these diagrams. Um, and try and extrapolate from that to work out what's really there. As it's pretty hard when they're talking only samples, you might have studied 300 stars and only seen six planets. So they haven't got much stats to go with, but they can still learn a little bit from it. The other thing they do is spectroscopy, actually try and measure the colours and spectra of these exoplanets. This is, of course, one thing that you can do with uh, imaging that you can't do in any other way. And you can see the data points. Here's the wavelength, starting at uh, the edge of the optical and going into the near infrared. And they've got a string of points here, and then just a few points out further into the infrared. And the lines are models. 
uh, different models of atmospheres, different compositions. At this stage, they probably can't tell very much. What they can tell is the data goes up to the red, so it's very red. It's probably quite dusty, and there may be their side of methane and things in the atmosphere. But at the moment, they haven't really learnt a lot from this. It's very difficult observationally. In terms of the statistics, what have they learnt? Well, you can combine the statistics um, with radial velocity data. So the radial velocity data tells you about giant planets close in typically within one or two astronomical units at most. And this data tells you about the ones that are much further out, so 10 or 20 astronomical units. And what you can see is it looks like giant planets are most common around 10 astronomical units out. The radial velocity data seems to suggest the numbers go up as you go out, whereas data from the imaging suggests they go up as you go in. So they peak somewhere in the range we can't observe, more than one astronomical unit, less than 10 or so. Probably 5 or 10 astronomical units out is where they peak, which is actually about where Jupiter is in our solar system. We can also tell that only about 0.6% of stars have giant planets a long way out, which is actually similar to the fraction that have giant planets very close in, the hot Jupiters that were seen very early on in the radial velocity, a 51 peg. So it looks like the giant planets very close and are very far out, they're, they're exciting, are the minority, the vast majority are roughly out where they are in our own solar system, as far as we can tell, which is a pain because that's the one place where we can't really see them except by microlensing. It also seems that these far-out giant planets are most common around massive stars. Now that's quite the opposite of what we've seen from transit data, which is that planets are most common around the lowest mass stars. So it looks like small rocky planets close and have the opposite trend from mega planets a long way out. What does that mean? No idea at this point. And one result that you can say from this we know that most stars are binaries. And so the question is, is there really a difference between a binary star, where you have a star with, say, a brown dwarf star neighbour, or a very massive planet as a neighbour? Could it just be that massive planets are like small brown dwarfs and they form in the same way that binary stars form? Or are they really something quite distinct that are called planets? Now, these surveys have found brown dwarf binaries. But so these are things that uh, you know, 50 or 60 uh, Jupiter masses or more. But it appears that they really are distinct. The lower mass things, the ones we would call planets, are more common close in and less common further out. Whereas the brown dwarf binaries, the brown dwarfs are more common further out and less common closer in. Now this is still very rubbery statistics because they've only got like five or six of each in the surveys. But that's enough to pick out the big trend. Also, it seems the planets get rarer as the mass goes up. If you remember those diagrams we saw a few slides back, we saw most of the planets are right down near the bottom. Whereas brown dwarfs get rarer as the mass goes down, they tend to be near the top of the diagram. So it does appear that these things really are different. Um, perhaps a different formation mechanism, that planets seem to form closer and they prefer to be smaller, only a few big ones are seen, whereas brown dwarfs tend to form further out and they're more massive ones. There seems to be a gap between them. So that's the update. Not as much progress as we'd like, but slow and steady progress is going on, and there's a lot of research now on developing even later, more powerful uh, systems, particularly for the next generation of extremely large telescopes that might be coming along in the next decade.